Introduction and Chapter One of The Secret of the Ninth Planet, Version Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Secret of the Ninth Planet, Version Two, by Donald Volheim. For three denizens of this minor planet, Eleanor, Bill, and of course Janet. The Mysterious Ninth World While the circumnavigation of the solar system seems far-fetched, it may not be once the problem of effective anti-gravitational control is solved. In this book I have assumed that the many researchers now actually at work on this problem will achieve such a result in the next decade. It is not at all impossible that they may, for we all know that the more minds that work at a problem, the sooner it will be solved. The discovery of a means of negating, reversing, or otherwise utilizing the immense force of gravitation for space flight purposes is now thought to be within the bounds of probability. It should occur sometime within the next hundred years, possibly in even the short period I assume here. Once solved, the severe handicaps imposed on space exploration by the weight and chemical limitations of rockets would no longer apply. The whole timetable of our conquest of the planets in our solar system would be tremendously speeded up, from hot mercury all the way out to frigid Pluto. In describing the visits of the spaceship Magellan to the planets, I have endeavored to adhere to known facts and the more reasonable assumptions about each of these worlds. The planet Pluto, however, deserves further comment, occupying as it does both an important role in this adventure and a unique one in actual astronomical lore. Back at the dawn of this century, many astronomers, and notably Dr. Percival Lowell, studied certain irregularities in the orbit and motion of Neptune, at that time believed to be the outermost planet. They decided that these eccentricities, or perturbations as they are called, could only be caused by the presence of another yet undiscovered planet beyond Neptune. Following this line of research, a young astronomer, Dr. Clyde Tombaugh, working at Lowell's own observatory, was able to announce on March 13, 1930, that he had finally found this ninth world, which he named Pluto. In the years that have followed, Pluto has proven to be a truly puzzling planet. Unlike its neighbors from Jupiter outward, it is not a giant world, light and gaseous in nature. Instead, it belongs physically to the small, dense inner planets, of which Earth is one. The latest viewpoint of this planet, whose size and weight seem quite like those of Earth, is that it may not be a true child of the Sun, but an outsider, captured as it roamed the trackless realms of galactic space. Its orbit is highly eccentric and rather lopsided, taking it as far away from the Sun as four and a half billion miles and as close to the sun as two and three-quarter billion miles, thereby cutting inside the orbit of Neptune itself. In fact, during the period from 1969 to 2009, covering most of the lifetimes of the younger readers of this book, Pluto will not be the ninth planet, but the eighth, for it will be at its closest in those years. Huge Neptune will thus regain temporarily the title of being the sun's farthest outpost. This orbital eccentricity has led some astronomers to speculate on the possibility that Pluto may once have been briefly held as a satellite of Neptune. And following that line of thought, the possibility also has been suggested that Neptune's larger moon, Triton, may once have been a companion of Pluto, which failed to break away from Neptune's grip. I think that the first men to land on Pluto are going to make some very astonishing discoveries but I am also sure that they will never go there in rockets. They will have to make the immense trip by some more powerful means, like the anti-gravitational drive. D.A.W. Chapter 1. Special Delivery by Guided Missile On the morning that the theft of the solar system of sunlight began, Burl Denning woke up in his sleeping bag in the Andes, feeling again the exhilaration of the keen, rarefied mountain air. He glanced at the still-sleeping forms of his father and the other members of the Denning expedition, and sat up enjoying the first rays of the early morning. 
The llamas were already awake, moving restlessly back and forth on their padded feet, waiting for their tender to arise and unleash them. The mules were standing patiently as ever, staring quietly into the distant, misty panorama of the mountains. It was, thought Burl, a dim day, but this he supposed was due to the earliness of the morning. As the sun rose it would rapidly bring the temperatures up, and its unshielded rays would force them to cover up as they climbed along the high mountain passes. The sky was cloudless as usual. Burl assumed that the dimness was due to volcanic dust or some unseen high cloud far away. And indeed, as the expedition came to life and the day began in earnest, nobody paid any attention to the fact that the sun was not quite so warm as it should have been. The Denning expedition, questing among the untracked and forgotten byways of the lost Inca ruins in the vast jagged mountains of inland Peru, was not alone in failing to notice the subtle channeling away of the sun's warmth and brilliance. They were, in this respect, one with virtually the entire population of Earth. In New York, in San Francisco, in Philadelphia and Kansas City, people going about their day's chores simply assumed that there must be clouds somewhere, the temperature only slightly less than normal for a July day. A few men shaded their eyes and looked about, noticing that the heat was not so intense, and thought it a blessing. In some places in Europe there were clouds and a little rain, and the dimness was ascribed to this. It was raining in much of Asia, and there were scattered afternoon showers through Latin America, which were standard for the season. There was a flurry of snow in Melbourne, and a cold blow in Santiago de Chile. The men in the weather bureaus noted on their day's charts that temperatures were a few degrees lower than had been predicted, but that was nothing unusual. Weather was still not entirely predictable, even with the advances of meteorology that were to be expected of the latter years of the twentieth century. The world was reading about other things than the vagaries of the weather. In the United States, baseball occupied the headlines, and the non-athletic minded could find some speculative interest in the completion of another manned space platform racing along in its eternal orbit 12,000 miles away from Earth's surface. The U.S. moon base in the center of Crater Ptolemaeus had described the appearance of this platform in an interesting radio dispatch which appeared on the first pages of most newspapers. The third prober rocket sent to Venus had been unreported for the tenth day after penetrating the clouds that hid the planet's surface from human eyes. It was, like its two predecessors, a minimum-sized unmanned instrument device designed to penetrate the clouds and radio back data on the nature of the Venusian atmosphere and the surface. But after its first report, nothing more had been heard. Some discussion was going on in science circles about what had happened. Speculation centered on the possible success of other types of prober rockets, but it was universally agreed that the time had not come when a manned rocket could safely undertake the difficult trip to Venus and return. The years of spaceflight since the orbiting of Sputnik 1 back in 1957 had produced many fascinating results, but they had also brought a realization of the many problems that surrounded the use of rockets for space flight. It was generally believed that no one should risk a manned flight until absolutely everything possible that could be learned by robot and radio-controlled missiles had been learned. It now looked as if Venus and Mars trips were still a dozen years away. Burl Denning was keenly interested in all of this. As a senior in high school, the newly expanding frontiers of the universe represented something special to his generation. It would be men of his own age who would eventually man those first full-scale expeditions to neighbor worlds. By the time he was out of college with an engineering degree, he might himself hope to be among those adventurers of space. Burl was torn between two interests. Archaeology was both a profession and a hobby in the Denning family. His grandfather had been among the first to explore the jungle ruins of Indochina. His father, although a businessman and industrial engineer, made annual vacation pilgrimages to the ruins of the old Indian civilizations of the Americas. 
Burl had been with him once before, when they had trekked through the chickle forests of Guatemala in search of a lost Mayan city. And now they were again on a quest, this time for the long-forgotten treasure of the Incas. Burl was thoroughly familiar with the techniques of tracking down the ancient records of mankind. He got along well with natives and primitive people. He knew the arts of wilderness survival. He knew the delicate techniques of sifting sand and dirt to turn up those priceless bits of pottery and chipped stone that could supply pages of the forgotten epics of human history. However, later in the day, it seemed as if their particular camp had petered out. There were ruins there, a broken-down wall, a dry well, and a bit of eroded bass relief lying on its side. Burl's father looked at him thoughtfully. The tall, sandy-haired youth was sitting astraddle a pile of dust, methodically sifting it through a wide mesh strainer. A large pile of sifted sand gave evidence of the length of his efforts, and one broken bit of clay was the only result he had obtained. Two of the Indian guides sat patiently in the shade watching them. One was digging slowly, turning up more dirt to be sifted. "'I think we've had enough here,' said the elder Denning. "'Burl, you can knock off. Tomorrow we'll pull up stakes and see what is in the next valley. We'll try to follow that old Inca road over the mountains. I don't believe anyone has ever penetrated there, and the airplane surveys indicated some evidence of human dwellings. Burl nodded and set the sifter down. He'd learned to curb his natural energies for the exacting task required of serious scientific research. Okay, he said. I was hoping you'd move on soon, Dad. This looked like a washout from the first. I'd say this place was sacked and ruined even before the Incas fell. The older man nodded. I suppose so. Well, let's wash up and see what's for supper. They went down to the icy mountain stream to wash the dirt from their hands. It's been a nice day, Burl commented. In spite of the sun being out steadily, it wasn't hot at all, cooler than yesterday. Mark Deming looked up at the sky and the sun lowering toward the horizon. There must have been some volcanic dust in the heavens, he said. The sun's been a bit dim, have you noticed? Burl squinted his eyes against the glare. Wasn't any eruption around here, maybe in Ecuador? His father shrugged. Could have been thousands of miles away, was his slow reply. Volcanic dust travels around the world, just as radioactive dust permeated the atmosphere from atomic testings. They say that the dust from the great Krakatoa explosion remained in the atmosphere for three years before the last of it settled. When they had finished supper and the sun was casting its last red rays over the rapidly purpling landscape, Burl got out the expedition radio, set up its antenna, plugged in its compact atomic battery, and tried to get the news from Lima. All he got was static. He fiddled with the dials for a long time, twisting the antenna, ranging the wavelengths, but there was static everywhere. Strange, he said to his father, something's disturbed reception completely. Pedro Gonzalez, their official Peruvian guide, leaned over. Could be the battery she has broken, eh? Burl shook his head. Not this battery, he said. It's a brand new one, a real keen development, and I already checked the wiring. It's some sort of disturbance that's blocking reception. Maybe we're in a dead zone or something. Wasn't dead yesterday, said his father. Maybe that eruption was radioactive. Burl looked up sharply. I'll check the Geiger counters, Dad. Something's blocking reception, something strong and powerful to interfere with this set. But when he returned, he had to admit he had found nothing. When the sun went down, they retired, for the temperature drops swiftly in the high, thin air of the Andes. In the rest of the world, people watched their color vision shows without interruption. Reception was good with the moon base, the space platforms had no difficulty making reports, and the radio news beamed out as usual. In Lima there was a little static, and direct transmission with Brazil seemed partially disrupted, but that was all. In the following five days the Denning expedition had managed the difficult climb over the next range of mountains and had come down in the high plateau valley between. In this same period, the world began to realize that the dimness of the sun was not a temporary phenomenon. Weather stations noted that the past few days had all been several degrees under the average. 
Reports had come in that farmers were querying the unusual drop in the temperatures at night, and astronomers measuring the surface heat of the sun came up with strange discrepancies from previous data. One astronomer communicated with another, and a general exchange of advice began. In a short while, a communication was laid on the desk of the President of the United States, who scanned it and had it immediately transmitted to the Secretary General of the United Nations. The Secretary General circulated the report among the scientific bureaus of all member nations, and this led in turn to a meeting of the Security Council. This meeting was held in quiet, without benefit of newspaper reporters or audience. There was no longer any doubt. The radiation of the sun reaching the face of the earth had decreased. The facts were indisputable. Where a day should have registered in some places at least 90 degrees in the sun, a reading of only 84 degrees was noted. Measures definitely showed that the face of the sun visible to man on earth had dimmed by just that margin. This might not prove serious at first, but as the scientists called in by the Security Council pointed out, it promised terrible things as the year went on. A difference of five or ten degrees all over the earth could mean the ruin of certain crops. It could mean an increase in snowfall and frost that could very rapidly destroy the economies and habitability of many places on the earth's teeming surface. But what, asked the chairman of the council, is causing this decrease in solar energy? This the astronomers could not answer. But they pointed to one factor. The reports from the U.S. moon base did not agree with the observations from Earth. Moon instruments claimed no decrease whatsoever in the amount of sunlight reaching the arid, airless surface of the Earth's only satellite. The cause was somewhere on Earth, and the Security Council requested the careful scanning of the Earth from space platforms and the Moon to determine the center of the trouble. Burl Denning had not found the next valley of much interest either. Evidence of an Inca road over the mountain had petered out. There were signs there had been human dwellings, but they were not Inca, just reminders of the one-time passage of an unknown band of primitives who had grazed their sheep, built temporary tents, and pulled up stakes perhaps a hundred years before. So again at night Burl, his father, and Gonzales took counsel. They were debating which way to proceed next, Mark Denning reasoning that they should go further inland following tales natives had told, Gonzales urging that they retract their path and proceed northward toward the regions where Inca ruins abounded. For the past week Burl had not been able to get radio reception. The static had increased as they had gone eastward over the mountain, but not a word of news or any human voice came through. The moon was rising on the horizon as Burl sat playing with the antenna. Finally he gave up and switched it off. The discussion had died away, and the three men were quiet. The Indian guides had retired to their own campfire, and one of them had taken out his pipes and was blowing a soft, plaintive tune. Burl stared at the full moon in silence, wondering if he would ever have a chance to walk its surface or if his own future was to lie in probing mankind's past rather than surveying the grounds of his future. As he watched, he thought he saw a faint light among the brightening stars where none had been before. He squinted, and sure enough, he saw that one tiny white light was swinging more and more toward the center of the sky. He pointed it out to his father and Gonzales. Too fast to be a celestial object, he said. Is it one of the space platforms or a Sputnik? The two men gazed at it in curiosity. Suddenly it seemed to grow brighter and sharper, and to twist toward them in its path. Look, gasped Burl, but the others were already on their feet. The light plunged down. There was a sudden outburst of yellow flame that caused the three to duck instinctively and brought the Indians to their feet with the yells. The glare brightened until they could see that something was just above them. The fire vanished as swiftly as it came, but a white spot of light remained. It's a parachute, Burl shouted. It's a rocket or something, breaking to a stop above us and coming down by parachute. In the pale light of the full moon they saw that something metallic and glistening hung from the white mushroom of a parachute. There was a clanging sound as it hit the rocky earth with a soft sighing whoosh. The cloth of the parachute settled. They ran across the dry stone of the valley floor 
but Burl's long athletic legs outdistanced the others. He reached it first. It was a cylinder of metal about three feet long and a foot in diameter. It's the nose of a message missile dropped from a guided missile, Burl announced. And look! He dramatically pointed the beam of his flashlight upon its side. There, written in black heat-resistant paint, were the words, To the Denning Andes Expedition, from U.S. Air Force Base, California Region, By Guided Missile Post by Moon Base Control, Ptolemaeus Crater, Official, Open Without Delay. End of Chapter 1 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com